Good morning. Good morning, good people of God. Welcome to this worship space, to our beautiful sanctuary where we can continue our renovation and creating and celebrating the sacred space that is among us, not just because it is stone and stained glass, but because it is us, the people of God. This is the second Sunday in Lent. It is the second Sunday of journeying with Christ into the wilderness. It is the second Sunday to rest from our Lenten practices, whether you are fasting from something specific or incorporating a new practice. Today is a day of rest, and this is a moment of worship. Let us worship God.
Beloved ones, God has heard our prayer this morning through the voices of our children for wisdom, strength, restoration, to be more like God in our minds, in our hearts, and in our actions. Be assured this day of God's mercy and forgiveness that brings us back, that brings us from a place of drifting back to God who is our center. For this we say, thanks be to God. People of God, having asked for and received God's love and forgiveness, we experience peace and assurance that rain down on us, and we are called to share that with others. Today we offer that same love and peace to all by saying, may the peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. People of God, as we are returning to our seats now, hear this epistle lesson from Romans chapter 4. For the promise that he would inherit the world did not come to Abraham or to his descendants through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. Hoping against hope, he believed that he would become the father of many nations. According to what was said, so shall your descendants be. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was already as good as dead, for he was about a hundred years old, and the barrenness of Sarah's womb. No distrust made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in faith as he gave glory to God, being fully convinced that God was able to do what God had promised. Friends, this is the word of God for us, the people of God.
answering us love. Thank you, God, for voices that sing and bells that ring. Thank you, God, for warm sunshine on my face and green grass where I can run and play. <laughs> Thank you, God, for families and friends. Thank you, God, for always being with me wherever I go. Amen. Would you stand with me as you're able for our gospel lesson? This is from Mark chapter 8, verse 34. Jesus called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If any of you want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. Because those who want to save their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel, they will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? The word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Now I'd like to dismiss our children, our K through second graders, if you want to go with Pastor Renee to children's worship. And now, gracious God, in these moments, may the words of my mouth 
May the meditations of all of our hearts together in this place be found pleasing to you. O Lord, you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I think you all have known me long enough that you know I don't usually begin my sermons with a joke. I think it's because when I was growing up, that's how almost every other preacher began their sermon, and the jokes were never good. (laughs) But I have a joke for us today. I told Evan I was going to tell a joke, and he told me he was terrified. (laughs) And so if this isn't funny, I may just start calling on people that I think are funny, and you can come up here instead. But I think this, take, this makes an important point, so hang with me. The story goes that a small plane with five passengers on it had an engine malfunction mid-flight. The pilot came out of the cockpit with a parachute pack strapped on his back and said, folks, I have some bad news and some good news. The bad news is that the plane's going down. There's nothing more I can do. The good news is that there are several parachute packs on this plane. The bad news is that there are four of them, and there are five of you. So good luck. Thank you for choosing our airlines, and we hope you have a good evening, wherever your final destination may be. And with that, the pilot jumped out of the plane. Well, a woman immediately leapt up from her seat and said, I am one of the most prominent brain surgeons in the country. My patients are depending on me, so I've got to have a parachute. She grabbed a pack, strapped it on her back, and jumped out of the plane. A man stood up and said, I'm a partner in a huge law practice. The law firm will fall apart without me. They are counting on me. And so he grabbed a pack, strapped it on his back, and jumped out of the plane. A third person stood up and said, I am the smartest person in the world. (laughs) My IQ is so high that I won't even tell you what it is, but surely you'll understand why I must have a parachute too. So they grabbed a pack, put it on their back, jumped out of the plane. Well, that left only two people on the plane, a middle-aged pastor and a teenage boy. The pastor said, son, you take the last parachute. You're young, you still have your whole life ahead of you. God bless you and have a safe landing. But the teenager just grinned at that older pastor and said, thanks, but there are still two parachutes left. The smartest man in the world just grabbed my backpack and jumped out of the plane. (laughs) Hey, it's funny. Okay, cheesy or not, here is the truth of the story. I think more often than not, we are all mid-air and all of us are clinging on to something. Desperately holding on. The question is, what are you clinging to? What are you holding on to so tightly that you're not willing to let go? And are you sure it's the right choice? You know, the reality is that Jesus has a lot to say about the things we choose to cling to in this life. And as he puts it in today's gospel reading, those who want to save their lives will lose them. And those who want to lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. Over and over again in all four gospels, Jesus corrects the disciples with a teaching that includes some kind of paradoxical formula like this one. That in order to have a full life, you have to be willing to give it away, to lose it, to let it go. But Jesus isn't talking about jumping out of planes here, so what is he talking about? The word life that he uses here in the Greek is psyche. It's that vitality of life that we talked about last week, that spirit of God within us that feeds us and sustains us and nurtures us in our very being. If you want to come alive, if you want to live life to the fullest, then he says, you've got to learn 
to let it go. So what are you hanging on to these days? What do you find yourself clinging to? What is taking up unnecessary room in your soul? And what would it look like for you to begin to learn to let it go? So throughout the season of Lent here at Highland, we are asking ourselves this question in worship, what is saving your life? What is it that makes you come alive? Because what the world needs, as Howard Thurman tells us, is people who have come alive. And I'm loving seeing some of your responses to this question on social media. I've seen Stephen Michael Carr, Kim Clark Endicott, Heather McDaniel, Paige Harlow, sharing some of their delights, moments that make their souls come alive. And it's a beautiful practice, a way of leaning into delight as an aspect of the holy in the world. Now, you might think, okay, this idea of delight sounds almost antithetical to the season of Lent, which is traditionally not a season of self-care, but self-denial. But as we learned last week, Jesus begins this journey of Lent by retreating to the wilderness which becomes a life-saving practice for him, something he returns to over and over throughout his entire ministry. And so maybe Lent is the perfect time for us to ask and then to begin to practice the very things that will sustain our lives as we journey with Jesus. So this week, I want to highlight another life-saving practice, something that has truly saved my life over and over again. And it's what I like to call wringing out your sponge. So my mentor, Julie Pennington Russell, who pastors First Baptist Washington, D.C., is who first introduced me to this idea. She says that we are all like sponges in the ways that we absorb all the chaos, everything that is happening in our lives and the world around us. I mean, just think about everything we have absorbed since the pandemic. What we absorb in our own families and relationships. What we absorb each day on the news and scrolling through social media, seeing story after story. Think about what we absorb just by doing life together as a church. Now, sometimes this absorbing quality can be really helpful, right? I think one of the beautiful things about being part of church is the ways that we help carry the load for one another, that we take one another's burdens, anxieties, and concerns so that we don't walk through these experiences alone. I mean, when crisis hits, I don't know what people do without church family. We carry these things. We walk these roads together. And then likewise, as a church, we are called to turn outward and to help carry the load for our neighbors and in our community, to faithfully respond to what's happening in the world. We don't turn a blind eye to what's going on and just live inside our own little Christian bubble. We engage. We lean in. We get our hands dirty doing this hard and holy work. But I don't know that any of us is consciously aware of all that we are absorbing right now. As multiple wars are breaking out across the world in the midst of a significant election year in our country, as women's rights and fertility possibilities are being threatened, as the next senseless shooting unfolds as crisis after crisis just pings from our phones, And there comes a point for all of us when we can't absorb anymore, when our sponges are full. And sure, we can try to keep absorbing and keep working and keep scrubbing and scrubbing, but after a while, it will begin to take a personal toll on us. And before long, we'll just start leaking out on other people. We can only sop up so much before our souls become rancid. Nadia Boltz Weber compares it to an old apartment building that she once lived in with what she called super sketchy electrical wiring. She writes, were I to audaciously assume that my hairdryer could run while my stereo was on, 
I would once again find myself opening the gray metal fuse box next to the refrigerator and flipping the breaker. My apartment had been built at a time when there were no electric hair dryers and the system shut down whenever modernity asked too much of it. She says, I think of that fuse box often these days because I just do not think our psyches were developed to hold, feel, and respond to everything coming at them right now. Every tragedy, every injustice, every sorrow and natural disaster happening to every human across the entire planet in real time, every minute, every day. She says the human heart and spirit were developed to be able to hold, feel, and respond to any tragedy, injustice, sorrow, or disaster that was happening in our own village. But now we have access to the entire world within a second. And maybe our emotional circuit breaker just keeps overloading because our hardware was built for a different time. She says, I'm not saying we should just put our heads in the sand, but I am saying that if your circuits are overwhelmed, there's a reason, and it's not because you are heartless. It's because there is not a human heart on this planet that can bear all of what is happening right now. We can feel it in our bodies, can't we? I know I can. I feel it in my neck. Feel it right now, actually. We feel it in our chest. Maybe it's that anxiety that beats so rapidly in our hearts or that churns within our stomachs whenever we are anxious or upset about something. It reminds me of the wisdom of the book, The Body Keeps the Score by Basil van der Kolk. And you know, the truth is that if we don't find ways to wring out our sponges, <laughs> they will ring us out instead. One way or another, the stress and chaos and anxiety and worry and fear and you fill in the blank that you are absorbing in your life right now, it has to come out. And if we are going to be people who keep doing the hard and holy work that I believe God is calling us to do and entrusting us to do in the world, then we must find time and ways to wring out our sponges. And maybe for you that looks like meditation or better boundaries or spiritual practices, prayer, counseling, journaling, exercise, time in nature, creativity, dancing, singing. The sky is the limit because sponge wringing avenues are endless. The point is, what does that look like for you? Now, I recognize that Jesus doesn't use this sponge wringing metaphor exactly, but I think you can see the parallel that those who want to hang on to their life, those who try to cling on to every last drop in their sponge that they have painstakingly soaked up from the world around them, will in the end have nothing left to give. But those who are willing to wring themselves out every now and then, to let some things go, and then to give themselves over for the sake of the gospel, they will save their lives over and over and over again. It's a cycle. We scrub and scrub, we wring out and are restored, and then we get back to scrubbing again. As Debbie Thomas puts it, the only path to success in Jesus' kingdom economy is through surrendering. Glory, by Jesus' definition, is not an accumulation. It's not permission to guard, hoard, and multiply yourself. Glory in God's kingdom is an exercise in subtraction. It's a movement downwards. It's the generous and perpetual expending of oneself in love. Now, of course, all of this is easier said than done, right? <laughs> It's why so many of us are walking around with soggy sponges most of the time. I think we do what a cow does when chewing its cud. It chews it, it swallows it, it regurgitates it, and then it starts chewing it all over again. 
And when we worry or ruminate on our anxieties and the chaos around us, we mull that same information over and over again in this endless cycle. And it's like we can't get off the Ferris wheel. We don't know how to turn it off. And so we never find new perspectives on our stress. And to be honest, maybe there is something almost addictive about soaking up the problems and anxieties of the world because we begin to think that they are ours to solve, that we can fix them on our own, and that we've got the power to fix them. So we just keep scrubbing and scrubbing harder and harder until we finally realize that we've missed the mark because part of wringing out our sponges is remembering that we are not God and surrendering ourselves over to the one who is and saying, let's do this hard and holy work together because I can't do it on my own. It's like the hymn text I discovered this week by writer Isaac Watts, who once wrote, why do we then indulge our fears, suspicions, and complaints? Isn't there a God? And shall God's grace ever grow weary of the saints? Friends, God's grace never grows weary of us. And so may we find healthy ways to wring out these sponges of all that they have absorbed. I hope we can spend some time this week living out the answer to that question. I might even ask you, how'd you wring out your sponge this week? And you can ask each other that as well. First, as my friend Julie puts it, We do this because God has given us a name, and it is beloved, not beleaguered. You and I were meant for more than a depleted and soggy half-life. And second, she says, God has given us a name, and it is creature, not creator. Christ has already absorbed the sin and chaos of this world, and so why in the world would we feel the need to let it kill us too? So for God's sake and your own, she says, lift up your sponges. (laughs) We lift them up to the Lord. (laughs) Lift them and squeeze them till your knuckles turn white. This is a faithful act. Amen. I'm mindful as we are going about this series asking what's saving your life. But the very first answer to that is Christ, that Christ has already done the work, that Christ has already absorbed the sin and the chaos of this world. And ours is simply to respond, to follow in the ways of Jesus, to be part of this scrub-a-dub community together where we seek to do this hard and holy work And where we remind each other to wring out our sponge when it's time to do that. And so if you'd like to make a decision to follow in the ways of Jesus, to be part of this community, we would love to welcome you today because the fact is that we need you. We are a more whole and more beautiful community of God when you are here a part of us and when you are doing this work alongside us. And so however you might be led to respond, we welcome you today as we continue in worship.
Join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, create in all of us a clean heart so that we may follow you in all that we say and do, even when we have doubts, even when we are scared. Create in us, like all the saints who have gone before us, the strength to love, trust, and implement your teachings so that we may provide the gift of joy, the gift of light, the gift of hope, and the gift of love to all peoples. Bless these monetary gifts we bring today. May they help provide these gifts of joy light, hope, and love to a world so very much in need of them. Amen. Church, I'm so glad that you've been here with us for these last few moments of worship together. I invite you to pass the friendship register. It's located underneath the chair uh, for those of you who are seated along the center aisle here. If you are visiting with us, we offer you a special welcome. On the back side of that friendship register is a folder with the word welcome on it. That's for you to take as an act of hospitality on our behalf to you to say, Come, come be a part of us, get to know us, wonder together with us about who we are and who God is. Ultimately, we're really, really glad that you are here today. Next Sunday at four o'clock is a service of remembrance for our pastor emeritus, Don Burke. All are invited to this time of remembrance. This is the last Sunday and then the last Wednesday this week in February, which means it is we are concluding Black History Month and our celebration there. On Wednesday, you are invited to the Brian Stevenson Lecture Part 2. If you were unable to attend Part 1, that's okay. Come anyway to Part 2. It's a beautiful lecture that invites us into greater wisdom and knowing. The youth... All of our teenagers, 30 of them, in fact, are traveling home from their retreat this afternoon. So please be in prayer for them and for our pastor to youth and young adult, Justin Sizemore, and each of our chaperones. If you have had a youth on retreat this weekend, I hope that you have had an opportunity to wring out your sponge. <laughs> as the youth have as well. 
And finally, as we continue in our renovation here at the close of the service, you are invited to bring your chairs this week to the center aisle, not the sides. Bring them to the center because painting is happening. And if you look around, you can see where some of the new paint is already in place and it looks beautiful. So again, chairs in the middle. For the ministries that shape the life of our community, together we say, thanks be to God. now this benediction. May the God who calls you from this place journey with you as you go. May God delight in you with joy, bringing unimagined graces. Walk with you in darkness, shining light along your way. May God be close to you in pain, giving strength for every moment, and comfort you in fear, granting courage to be brave. May God's love surround you. May Christ's mercy astound you, and may the Spirit abound in you so that you live in the fullness of the God who is with us always. Amen. Amen.